What's going on, you guys? Nick here with Nick Strength and Power. I've got a couple of interesting stories for you guys today. The first story that I've got for you guys, we got a little bit of a sneak peek of what Chris Bumstead is looking like. You can kind of see his arm and his shoulder in this picture. And I'm going to show you guys a little bit of a brief clip from the Hani Rambod video today where he did a training session with Hadi, Derek, and Chris. So you got the Instagram updates, but I think the more valuable update came from Hani's video where there was a couple clips of Chris actually training where he rolls up his sleeves. And granted, you can't see a whole lot. You can see his arms and his shoulders, but from what you can see, I think that it's safe to say Chris looks absolutely dialed in. He looks super vascular, super lean. You can see it in his face that he's depleted. He just, he looks super freaky here. And I think that's one of the biggest things about Chris that we've talked about a lot is the stage presence and kind of the freak factor that he has for classic physique specifically. He has the ability to be not only the biggest, tallest, and arguably most muscular guy on stage in classic physique, but he's got the aesthetics, the lines, and conditioning to go with that. And I think when you watch this video and you see him training and you see how freaky he looks, that's the freak factor he has. He's not just a smaller, more aesthetic bodybuilder like a lot of people think of classic physique. He's an aesthetic bodybuilder. He's got that classic look, but he's got this freak factor that goes along with it that I just think a lot of these guys don't quite have. He's like a combination of open bodybuilding and, and classic, really. I really think you could take Chris Bumstead without even adding any size, Chris Bumstead's classic physique Olympia look and put him on most pro bodybuilding open show stages. I'm not talking about necessarily the Olympia or the Arnold, but you could probably put that version of Chris Bumstead in any open lineup that's like a Tampa pro or whatever. And I think he would either do very well or win most of those shows. He's got like a crossover appeal to his physique where I don't think a lot of classic guys do. And I think that height disparity is a big part of it, the height and weight limits in classic physique. For example, I don't think you would ever see Ramon or Terrence or Breon, granted Breon was in 212, go to an open show and win. Whereas with Chris, I think that's a very real possibility. And I'm talking about as is without having to add a bunch of size. And I think that little bit of freak factor that Chris has is the difference maker and the reason why he's undefeated. And I think also the reason why he will go undefeated again this year. And I still think the crazy thing is when you think about Chris, the fact that he's only 29 years old. And even after, if he wins the Olympia this year, which I think he will, even after winning the Olympia this year, he will have six Olympia titles and still only be 29. So with this conversation of retirement, as much as it seems like he might and will this year, he's still only 29. Think of how insane that is if he retires at 29, but already has six Olympia titles. And I think that's also what makes it so hard for the other guys to beat him because kind of the cool thing about classic physique and why I think it's so appealing right now is Urs, Ramon, Terrence, Breon's older than the rest, but Urge, Ramon, Terrence, Wesley, Sebum, the guys that are really at the top right now, they're all around the same age. So when it comes to dethroning the champion, it's not like there's a big age gap where Chris has six titles, or he has five titles now, sorry, but he will have six, I think. But it's not like you've got this big age gap where you've got this guy that's been winning and winning and winning, and he's older than these young up-and-comers. Chris is young, too. And that's why I think even if he didn't retire, he could continue to win and I think break the record. The record in open bodybuilding, of course, being eight. Chris already has the record in the classic physique category. But after this year, if he won two more titles, he would only be 31 years old with the record number of Olympias, eight titles at 31. I mean... <laughs> it's hard It's hard to even comprehend how much success Chris has had at such a young age. But again, that's also why it's so hard for these guys to catch him because it's not like he's on his way out. It's not like he's older. It's not like he's 40 plus. The guy's not even 30 and he's already won five times. 
And I think even you could see a scenario where Chris takes an extended break. Maybe he announces that he's retiring this year and he takes several years off. Even if he took six years off, he could come back at 35 and still have five, six, seven more years of a prime, healthy bodybuilding physique where he could come back and try to get two more titles if he wanted to tie the record. So if he wanted to take an extended break and focus on his health and raising his new his new daughter and his family and all that stuff, he could take five, six years. And he would still be young enough to come make a comeback if he wanted to. So I think that's another thing to consider as well. Even if Chris retires this year, I, I, that might not be the last we ever see of him. He's got so much time, even though I don't think he needs the Olympia anymore. I think the Olympia needs Chris more than Chris needs that title. But maybe after a few years of not competing and taking a break, he'll get that itch again to come back. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. What are your Olympia predictions for Classic Physique this year? I'm probably going to add my predictions for every division to tomorrow's video, so stay tuned for that. All right, guys, today's video is brought to you by the Arnold Sports Festival. Go to their website, arnoldsports.com, buy some merch, buy some tickets for next year, watch the replay of last year's live stream for free, and look forward to and anticipate another live stream in 2025. I was born a bodybuilder, and I will die a bodybuilder. This is the number one bodybuilding show in the world. It was really spectacular. We're going to go up to $500,000 for the winner next year. Now, in more classic physique news, we got a recent physique update from Mike Sommerfeld. Mike has been looking really impressive in a lot of his updates. If you guys didn't know, he was eighth in last year's classic physique Olympia, and he looks like he's added a pretty good amount of muscle since then. He looks a lot bigger to me. His lower body looks really good, really good quads, crazy V taper on this guy. And the two guys separating him from the top six last year, well, we'll say three guys, Wesley Vissers was 7th last year. I'm assuming Wesley will be a lot higher than that this year. Michael DeBull was 6th. He's actually looking really impressive too. Uh, Terrence Ruffin was 5th though. Terrence sitting out this Olympia. Breon 4th, Urs 3rd, Ramon 2nd, Chris in 1st. So does Mike have an opportunity to move up a little bit here? He would need to move up 2 placings to be top 6 in the Classic Physique Mr. Olympia. Terrence is gone, so that's 1 placing he already moves up. And I guess the main guy we'd be looking at is probably Michael DeBull and probably Breon. Because I think Wesley will be top three this year, and I think it'll be, it'll be Breon probably in fourth or fifth. And I think Michael and uh, Mike Sommerfeld will be battling it out for who cracks the top six there. But he looks very impressive in this update. And Michael DeBull who just recently won a show qualifying for next year's Classic Physique Mr. Olympia. So he's another guy that competed right up before the Olympia this year. He just posted a video where his conditioning looks absolutely insane. He looks very, very gnarly here. And I think that's kind of been his calling card at most of the shows that he does. The guy comes in really good shape. And like I said, he was top six last year. I think that's really worth pointing out that Michael DeBull actually beat Wesley at last year's Olympia. Wesley was in seventh, Michael in sixth, which is interesting because obviously how much does that really matter at this point? Because a lot of these guys beat Wesley last year and Wesley beat all of them at the Arnold. But I would say the main thing that Michael needs to work on on stage is I was watching him pose at the last show that he did where he qualified for 2025's Olympia. His posing is still a little bit awkward. It's still a little bit off, a little bit shaky. It didn't look like he was holding the poses very long, but he has a superb physique, superb conditioning. And I think it is pretty noteworthy that he did beat Wesley at last year's Olympia. So I'm kind of wondering as I look at last year's top six, how much will that top six change? And will anybody from the top six last year move out of the top six? I think the biggest change this year will be Wesley moving into the top six. And we did get a picture today of Wesley in arguably his biggest rival right now, Ramon Dino, which is kind of the other thing that I really enjoy about Classic Physique is with all these guys being right around the same age, they're all kind of bros. There's like a very strong sense of camaraderie 
that really isn't even in men's open bodybuilding. It is kind of to an extent. Some of those guys are friends, but it seems like all the top guys in classic physique are really cool, really friendly. They all get along with each other. Um, and we got to see Wesley and Ramon today. It looks like they were in the gym together. Ramon not really showing off a lot of his physique here. Wesley, of course, is. I think Wesley is walking around Vegas extremely confident in how he's looking. And just a very arbitrary co uh, comparison here. I would say that Wesley's face looks a little bit more death facey than Ramon's. There's a little bit of puffiness, a little bit of fullness to Ramon's face here. And Wesley's face has been looking crazy, sunken in and wrinkly all week. But really, kind of a stupid comparison. There's really not much to go on here. But it was cool to see Wesley and Ramon together just days before the Olympia. Maybe even training together just days before the Olympia. And I think that's the biggest rivalry going into the show. Even bigger than Chris versus Ramon. I think Ramon redeeming himself against Wesley is the biggest story in classic physique. Aside from Chris winning and then potentially retiring this year. I'm most excited to see, maybe even more honestly guys... Maybe even more than anything in men's open bodybuilding. I think I might be more excited to see Ramon versus Wesley, the rematch. Because if Wesley really is able to move into that top two spot, I think that's one of the most exciting things that we'll see happen at the Olympia this year. Unless, you know, somebody comes out of nowhere in open bodybuilding and beats uh, Hottie or Derek. Maybe Samson comes in totally peeled and ends up winning the thing. Or maybe someone that we're not expecting at all comes in and beats everybody. I don't know. But right now, the storyline that I'm following the most closely is Ramon versus Wesley. Now, let's pivot over to 212 for a second here because this is one thing that I'm also very excited for is the rematch between Keon and Sean Clarita. Keon, in the updates that we've seen from him this year... I think without a doubt, this is the most impressive, improved version of Keon we've seen to date. Conditioning-wise, size-wise, just everything about him going into this show, these prep updates are the best that I've seen from Keon. And I've also seen stuff from Keon that I can't even share with you. Updates that he hasn't posted. And I'm telling you, it's the best Keon we've ever seen by far. But we did get this public update of him posing from the back, where you can see the glutes are dialed in, the hamstrings, his back to me looks like he's added some density to it, some detail to it. Hamstrings look absolutely crazy. Like I've said in previous videos, I think this is the best lower body that we've ever seen from Keon. Which is what I think makes the 212 division so exciting this year, is you've got this kind of dichotomy between Keon and Sean. Sean basically hasn't posted anything. We have no idea what he looks like. He's trying to do what Hadi Chupin did at the Arnold. He wants to come back with a vengeance after losing his title. So on one hand, you've got Keon, the new champion, posting a ton of updates, I think clearly looking the best he's ever looked. And then Sean leaving us wondering, what is this package that Sean is going to unveil versus this new and improved Keon. Is Keon going to come in and blow this thing out of the water? Or is Sean going to come in with something crazy that's even better than what Keon is bringing? And I think that mystery is what, it was what makes me so excited for 212. But personally, I think Keon is going to win this again. He just, he looks incredible. And there was also this update of Keon from a couple days ago where he's showing off his quads. And I want to get your guys' opinion on this because it took me several times watching this to figure out what people were talking about. All the comments were saying, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And I finally figured it out. So if you guys are watching this video of him flexing his quad, do you guys see it the first time you watch it? Once you see it, you can't unsee it when you're looking at his quads. Tell me in the comments below if you guys got what, what they're talking about. Because I didn't see it the first couple times I watched it. And then I was reading the comments. I was like, what are they talking about? And then, then I saw it. Now, next up in the news, I saw a couple of posts from the new Olympia owner, Jake Wood, of some of the different, uh, like, in Vegas advertising they had for the Olympia. And I thought a lot of it was pretty cool. The coolest of which being this, I guess it's supposed to be a miniature of the sphere 
inside of the hotel. And one of the reasons why I wanted to showcase this is, number one, I think this is the kind of production value that fans would like to see a lot of that money go towards rather than the the smoke and the lasers and all that crazy stuff on stage. I think this marketing material and these cool things in Vegas during the Olympia weekend, I feel like that's the cooler place to see some of that production money spent because I think all those bells and whistles on the stage, like we've talked about before, kind of takes away from the bodybuilder from the competition itself. And I think a lot of it's unnecessary, just kind of ancillary stuff. But I thought this mini sphere thing was kind of cool. I thought the marketing on the outside of the hotels was really cool. And I saw an interview with Jake Wood. I can't remember what the website was that did the interview now, but I saw an interview with him recently where he talked about watching UFC 306, which was held in the sphere and how his dream and a goal for him is to one day hold the Olympia in the sphere, which I think is something that if done correctly could be one of the coolest things for bodybuilding, especially if they treated it like the UFC did where the UFC and Dana White kind of said, we're treating this as like a one-off event. This is not going to be the standard going forward. We're probably going to lose money on this, but I want to do something cool. I want you to have the best possible produced fight experience you can have. And I think if they go into it with that idea like a one-off Olympia where this is you know, the coolest, the best, the highest production value, even if we lose money just to give it to the fans. I was watching UFC 306 and I was thinking this would be perfect for a bodybuilding show because the bulk of the screen of the sphere is on one side of the sphere. So it's like the roof of the sphere, kind of parts of the sides and then you've got half the sphere, which is obviously where people are sitting. Those are the stands. Those are the bleachers. Then the other half of the sphere is like all screen. And that's where the show is, which is a little bit more difficult for something like the UFC to not have like a Coliseum style arena where the ring or the octagon is in the center and you have people sitting 360 all the way around the ring because a fight you want to be able to see from all angles, but bodybuilding would be perfect for something like the sphere because bodybuilding, you're only looking at the guys straight on from one angle. So you could have the bodybuilders in front of that back giant screen wall of the sphere. And if they do that screen correctly to where it's not too bright, there's not a bunch of advertisements on it. They could use it as big replay screens. So you could see the bodybuilders blown up really big on the sphere, on the sphere screens. I think that would be just absolutely awesome. And I think this mini sphere gives us a little bit of a teaser of what the outside of the big sphere might look like. And I, just seeing this in combination with the interview that I was reading of Jake Wood, I feel like maybe he is actually serious about one day putting on the Olympia at the sphere, which I think would probably be one of the coolest bodybuilding events in history. I don't know how many tickets they would actually sell the sphere. I believe is a much bigger venue than uh, Resort World where the Olympia is being held this year. And it's a little bit of a challenge because it's also like how many how many extra live stream tickets would they really sell just off the basis of, well, the venue is really cool because you don't really get the full experience of the venue on the live stream. So how many more live streams would that actually sell? I think they would really have to treat it as a one-off. Maybe they take a loss just for the legacy of having a really cool show. But I thought the UFC did it really well where they kind of made the live stream immersive to where you got to kind of experience the sphere on the stream almost in the same way that the people in the audience did. But I don't know how realistic that is um, for the production level of a bodybuilding show, even at the highest level of the Olympia. I don't know how possible it would be to do what the UFC was able to do. And I believe it cost over $20 million to even produce the UFC at the sphere. And I'm sure they sold way more live streams than a bodybuilding show would ever sell. And just so you guys know, there's no bodybuilding show that's profiting $20 million. Not even the Olympia. But anyway, this is getting a little bit too long winded. I just wanted to show you guys that mini sphere and talk a little bit about Jake's uh, ambition to do that someday, which I think would be really cool. I think it'd be really big for bodybuilding. And I think that venue, the way that it's set up for viewing I think would really lend itself well to a bodybuilding show and just the the way that you're viewing it. I think the sphere would be a good fit for that. 
Now, the final story that I've got for you guys today. There is a new Mr. World champion. The Mr. World was held this past weekend, the week before the Olympia. And it's a guy that we talked about just a few videos ago, winning the Mr. World for the second time. Destiny5 on Instagram, or Bodebe Devo Nadukaru is his actual name. And they just posted the clip of him posing from that show. Again, now he's two-time Mr. World. So again, the reason why I was talking about him in the last video is because he comes from the other IFBB, the IFBB Elite Pro. And right now, he is the best bodybuilder they've got. And it seems like once bodybuilders reach a certain level in the other IFBB, because the competition over there, honestly, isn't as tough. It's not the, it's not the same caliber as what we have here what we have with the Olympia, what we have with the IFBB Elite Pro. So eventually the top guys from there that really want to challenge themselves end up over here on the Olympia stage in the real IFBB. For example, I think the best example being Michael Crizzo, Rubiel Mascara, Nexilla, uh, Good Vito, Vitaly Ugonikov, and even Andrew Jacked. I believe some of the first competitions that he did just as an amateur was like their amateur league equivalent of the NPC. And then eventually he came over here and turned pro at a NPC pro qualifier. But now he's won essentially their Mr. Olympia title, the Mr. World, it's basically their biggest title. He's won it twice. And I wonder if we will eventually see him on an IFBB pro league stage in the near future. He's reached the top of that organization two times in a row. And he kind of resembles to me... Obviously, he's not as big as Andrew Jack. He's not as tall as Andrew Jack. But if you look at the roundness of his muscle bellies, he, in that sense, he reminds me of Andrew. Just the roundness of his delts, of his arms. He's kind of got that really 3D pop-out-at-you physique. And I want to see him on a pro league stage, honestly. I want to see him make that, uh, make that transformation. Transition, I guess, would be a better word. But overall, I just wanted to share this with you because I thought it was a very unique and impressive physique, and I thought you guys might enjoy watching these Mr. World clips. So that's going to wrap it up for the video today, guys. I hope to see you guys in the next one. So make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, click that bell, notification icon, all that good stuff. And as always, I love you guys. appreciate you guys. Nick Strength and Power, signing out. All right, guys, don't forget to click that like button and subscribe to this channel if you enjoy the content. Also, check out my Instagram at Nick Strength Power, my Facebook page, which is simply Nick Strength and Power, my secondary YouTube channel, Nick Strength and Vlogs, for vlogs and bonus content that you will not see on this channel. And consider subscribing to my third YouTube channel, Nick Strength and Pokemon, which is all things Pokemon and trading card games completely unrelated to this channel. So if you're into that, Give that one a look, and all links to merchandise and social media will be in the description box below. If you guys want a Nick Strength and Power t-shirt, that will be in the Shopify link below. Have a great day.